So there you go, we're live streaming now. So, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Tess Crawley. If you've not um, come across me before, I am formerly a university lecturer. I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I'm endorsed in both clinical and forensic psychology areas of practice. And I have a group practice in Tasmania. So I have an office in Hobart, an office in Launceston, and we do some rural outreach around parts of Tasmania. Um, and more recently, I have started focusing on a real passion area of mine, which is mentoring other mental health professionals. And, uh, and so I run a live show on Thursdays, and I have some um, Facebook groups as well. So if you're interested in Facebook, if you're on Facebook, if you search my name, I'll pop up like measles. <laughs> really, I'm kind of all over the thing like a rash at the moment. Um, a really honest caveat, and this, this uh, presentation today very nearly didn't happen. Um, I have, uh, my wonderful psychology team has uh, been going through incredible rupture, and if you know about attachment theories, you'll talk about rupture and repair in perinatal work, which is a special area of interest of mine in practice. Uh, and so we have had a bit of a perfect storm happening in Hobart lately of contracts coming to an end, people reaching their clinical endorsement, a brand new practice like a super clinic opening up in Hobart, all these things coming together at the same time and has meant a lot of staff movement in my practice. So it's been a really difficult time emotionally. And again, if you're following the live show, uh, you will have seen me talk about that. Uh, and I talk about it from the perspective of how does this help other practice owners navigate the emotions that come with getting attached to people and then as they come into your practice, getting excited about what they're, what they're bringing into your practice and then that emotional upheaval that comes when you have to say goodbye and there's been a lot of goodbyes lately so it's been an interesting time, a challenging time. Um, okay, now today what I'm going to be talking about in this session is how I built my team um, and I guess the nice thing about this talk actually going ahead because initially I felt almost like an imposter when things started to uh, um, you know, become apparent that there was so much change going on in my team at the moment. I thought, oh my gosh, how can I get up and talk about building a team? When actual fact, I'm now rebuilding a team and I'm using the exact same principles that I talk about in the book and talking about in this session. So going right back to one of our core um, missions in the practice that I run, we have three streams really, perinatal mental health, rural mental health, and nurturing and developing new clinicians. So we identify as a training clinic and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So it's sort of interesting, I find myself back in this position of rebuilding a team and going back to these ideas of incorporating interns and provisional psychs and other early career mental health professionals into the team. Those of you who've come a little bit late, you do get a copy of the book, so come and, and grab me at the end of the session because I'll have to open a box and that'll be noisy, so I won't do it now. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I want to do today, I want today to be a little bit of a conversation because it's meant to be a how-to session, not a lecture. So I want you to have a think about your favourite supervisor. You could also think about your least favourite if you really want to do. But the whole idea is to think about what was it like for you to be supervised? What did you love about that specific supervisor? What made them the best supervisor that you had? And what quality did they bring to your experience of being supervised? So I had some supervisors who were really quite woolly around the edges and kind of left, left me to free range. And I had some supervisors who were really direct, really blunt uh, and really honest, but awesome and everything in between. So when you think about being supervised, when you remember back to being a supervisee, what were the qualities that really come to mind for you that just, yeah, that's what I want to be like. That's the kind of supervisor I want to be. So keeping these ideas in mind as we're talking about this idea of bringing clinicians into your practice at that really beginning stage of their, their careers. So a lot of what I talk about is, that, is building that bridge between student and professional. And that's something that, that uh, comes across a lot in the work I do with, with um, interns in my practice and provisionals in my practice. Is, I get so much joy out of watching them make that transition from student to professional. So just have a little think about what it was that you loved about being supervised by certain supervisors. 
I think the very the <laughs> the supervisor that always comes to my mind when I think about this, the couple of things and, and these pop up in the book. One of them was she firmly wrapped me across the knuckles for writing essays in case notes. And that has well and truly informed my work with my students. No one's got time to read an essay. No one's interested in every single word that has ever entered my head about a client. I need to write concisely and efficiently from a time management perspective, but also from the time management that other people have to work towards. No one's got time to read all my ramblings and my musings. So becoming very efficient in my note taking, it was a direct result of working with that particular um, supervisor. Interestingly, when I went into, super, into private practice, first words out of her mouth were, don't you dare undercut me, which then informed my beliefs around charging my worth. You know, instead of feeling I wasn't uh, allowed to charge as much as, as my professional peers, uh, it was a different way of looking at how we, how we price our services and how we structure that. Okay. <clears throat> so as we go through today, just keep these ideas in your mind, jot them down, um, and keep them as little touchstones for you when you're thinking about your own journey as a supervisor. Now, there's some key differences, and we sometimes use these words interchangeably because, some, uh, because obviously when we're talking about psychology interns, they usually are provisional psychologists, but they're not all coming to us as students. So with the advent of the, uh, the Master of Professional Psychology, so the 5 plus 1 program, we're now sort of, I guess, um, more clearly defining who's an intern and who's a provisional psych on my team. So to put it very simply, typically an intern is a student, they're unpaid, the payment, if you like, that they get for participating in my team is progress towards completion of their qualifications, uh, requisite hours of supervision and um, client contact. Do you mind if we take Go for it, go for it. This live stream, by the way, will be um, accessible from um, Facebook, so whenever you want to follow up later, you'll be able to access this for yourselves as well. Um, so interns typically require about a day, uh, sorry, an hour per day of placement, uh, of supervision. We're going to talk about that because that freaks people out. That's the first thing that freaks people out. Oh my God, I'm going to lose some client, some client content, I'm going to lose income. So we're going to talk about that. Um, typically, their insurances are covered by the university as a first port of call, but they also come under your policy okay whereas a provisional could be a graduate so they could be a graduate of, a, of an MPP program or the five plus one program they could be um, completing a master's in uh, psychology whether it's in TAS we in Tassie we've only got clinical so if I default to talking about clinicals it's because that's all we've got but I'm I'm meaning any M psych program um, <clears throat> Typically a provisional would be paid, but I know that a lot of the five plus one um, provisionals are looking for any kind of, of internship for that, that plus one year. Um, if they can find a paid internship that meets the APRA requirements, they're really, really lucky, and I'm gonna talk about what we're offering. Um, and uh, otherwise, some of them will put their hand up to do a free internship. Now, in my view, typically, if the, um, if the client is paying a going rate fee, then the intern or the provisional should be paid for that. Okay. If, uh, in my practice, typically interns are not paid and the clients are typically not charged. The exception to that might be, say, if we're running a group and there are costs involved in running that group, then we might charge a, a nominal fee to the client to um, cover those costs, but the intern would still be unpaid. With the provisionals, we're working around a model that basically looks at charging a, a rate that's commensurate to what a, a counsellor in the community might charge. So there's no Medicare rebates for provisionals, but you can charge them out at a going rate of what a, what a uh, counsellor might charge or some other form of therapist without Medicare eligibility might charge. And then of course you're paying your provisional um, per the award. So that's as a casual or as a, an ongoing employee. You cannot contract provisionals, okay? That's not allowed. And you cannot charge Medicare. Uh, it, even if you're, if you're supervising a provisional, you can't put uh, a claim to Medicare through under your uh, provider number. That's considered Medicare fraud. And as I say in the book, bad things happen when you commit Medicare fraud. We don't want to go there. Now, when you're looking for an intern in your private practice or a provisional, we can sort of start using, now we can start talking about interns or provisionals flexibly because we're talking about a person in your practice um, who's going to require a lot of input from you. 
So preferably you want someone who's already got some one-on-one experience with clients. So when I'm bringing interns into my practice, I've got a really good relationship, long-standing relationship with the University of Tasmania. I used to be the placement coordinator there and the current placement coordinator was once a student of mine. So, you know, fairly good relationship going on there. Um, and my request is always to have um, interns who are at the end of their placement program. So they're within a bull's roar of completing their masters so that when they've, they've finished all their masters, they might choose to then stay on in my team as a member of my team, then as a clinical registrar in, in our case. Um, but they don't have to stay. And I have certainly have had students who've come through and then moved on to other things after their placement with us. You ideally want them to have completed some ethics and professional practice training. And, and I think this is actually a really important point for a number of reasons. You want them knowing the limits to their role. You want them knowing um, what dilemmas they might be facing. You want them knowing when to ask questions. And you don't want a cowboy. Because once your intern becomes a little bit more autonomous in your team, and they will over time, you want, you want to be confident that they know what the ethical requirements are of them in their role. They've got to be teachable. And that's something that you'll figure out in your conversation <coughs> with the placement coordinator at the university. So your relationship with the placement coordinator, if you don't have one, uh, a relationship with a placement coordinator, get one. <laughs> Go meet them. They're nice people and they're always looking for um, new placement opportunities for their students. So don't be afraid to approach the universities and, and just start a conversation. It might take you a while to build a relationship, but start, just start that conversation. Be aware of what your team culture is and identify whether or not this potential intern is actually a good fit for that team culture because they will become an integral part of your team for the minimum six months that they're with you, um, typically. Helps if they've got an interest in the area that you have an interest in. So I'm always excited when I have a student who's interested in perinatal mental health and infant mental health. Um, and then, um, like I, say, I said before, you know, the superstar students are the ones who've just got some hours to complete. Um, now what we find, people worry about how many client contact hours, how many supervision hours can you provide in private practice. We always find that students get more hours out of us than they tend to in many other placements and uh, I'll talk about that in a minute when I'm talking about time. When it comes to your confidence, this is a big issue. This is why I wrote the book because there are so many really experienced clinicians in private practice, eligible supervisors who don't feel confident enough if they're really honest with themselves about taking on a student in private practice. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What students are looking for, they're looking for your competence, not in everything, okay? It's okay to be really competent in your area of interest and not know much about assessments or forensics or whatever it might be. An intern wants to know that you're comfortable in your comfort zone because that's what they're gonna learn from you. Obviously they want to see that you're confident in yourself, but they also want to know that you're confident in them. So being able to trust them is a journey that the two of you will go on together over time. And that comes through lots of observation. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Collegiality, they want to feel that they're part of your team. They want to see you getting along with other practice owners. They want to see you getting along with other areas of practice in the community. They want to see what it looks like to be a professional, in other words, in the field of psychology. And of course, compassion. So be kind, buy them coffee, take them out for lunch occasionally for supervision. They're really poor. They'll love you forever mm -hmm. if you do stuff like that. But compassion, I think in terms of, they will make mistakes. They won't always get it right. Um, but in my experience, there are very few mistakes that can't be corrected in some way or another. Um, and certainly with an intern uh, at the tail end of their placement experience, you've already got some knowledge from the placement coordinator of, of what their skill set is, what experience they've had, and how much you can throw at them um, and still be within their competence level. Okay. That's a photo of me in about 2006. So that's uh, when I just got my clinical endorsement. Well, it wasn't endorsement then, it was college membership back in those olden days. 
Um, and yes, I used to get around the university in plaits and um, I should probably go back to that because it's a really good look. Um, and I was on the verge of becoming the placement, as a clinic director and placement <laughs> coordinator. Um, and that was a wild ride, indeed. So, uh, yes, I'm a vampire, Emma. <laughs> no, 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 I said you look 15. You look 15 years old in that. Don't what? <laughs> Child prodigy, we always knew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah I'm, the, I'm the female Doogie Howser. Um, all right, so how do you get an inter in intern? Like I said before, you really need a good relationship with a placement coordinator because the placement coordinator needs to get to know you. They need to know what student, they need to have you in mind for when they're looking at students and where they're gonna place all these students. They need to be able to meet this student and go, oh my God, that'd be a perfect fit. That person and that person, I need to get them together because that would be a great placement. Okay, so you need to have that relationship, have those conversations going. Um, let the placement coordinator come and check out your rooms, buy them coffee too, coffee goes a long way in this world, um, and, and let them understand what your interest areas are, but also what your um, confidence deficits are. If you're not confident taking someone on for their very first placement, it's okay to say so. If you don't want to teach that much in your placement program, you don't have to, it's okay. Um, once uh, an intern has been identified, you get the opportunity to interview them. Well, we, it's not really an interview, it's a pre-placement pre meeting. But you can consider it an interview because you still have the opportunity to say, no, I don't think this is a good fit. So having a chat with the placement coordinator gets things set up nicely so you're more likely to get a good fit, but you've still got an escape clause at that pre-placement meeting where you can actually clap eyes on the person and I've actually had a couple of students that at the pre-placement meeting, a whole bunch of what I thought were gonna be problems were debunked. So we have a member of our team at the moment, Arthur. He's absolutely fabulous. Came to me as a student. He's from Hong Kong. English is his third language. He had a really thick accent and the place, and we'd never had a male student. And uh, placement coordinator said, well, I've got Arthur. Oh, he's going to be right for you but yeah he's really keen and I don't know what you think I think it could work you really should give it a go so she knew us and she knew what, what we're all about uh, so I met with Arthur and he was amazing and he's done phone work with our rural clients who haven't cared two hoots that he's got a bit of an accent because his empathy is so good he's just really switched on to clients needs so when you have that pre-placement meeting something that might not look ideal on paper can actually be, you know, what we like, we make assumptions, you know. Um, and as I say, it's okay to say no. It's also okay to terminate a placement early if it's not a good fit. If, it, if you've given it a burl and it's not worked out and that doesn't have to be a penalty laden discussion. So it's not that they've necessarily failed the placement. You can actually say, look, this isn't working out for this reason, that reason. Perhaps you need more supervision at this stage in your career than I can provide right now or perhaps your interest in this area, I just don't get those referrals to be able to give that to you. And maybe you'll be better spent diverting your placement attention and your time elsewhere. So you can have sensitive and compassionate conversations around that if you need to. Uh, that's also me. <laughs> um, no plaits. No plaits, but do you like the term? Uh, so I, I like to really point out clearly that interns are not pseudo admin staff. Okay. Uh, a lot of people ask me, is it okay to have a student answer the phones for me? Is it okay to have a student do the filing for me? Now in the book, I, I do lots of shouty capitals, no, <laughs> but I also acknowledge it's okay to involve students in those things because they learn a little bit more about what goes on in a practice, but that should not be the reason you have them there. They are not there to act as an admin person for you. Um, they are not free labor, in other words. Um, initially, when we have an intern in the practice, they will sit in with the clinicians in the team. So I've got a group practice, so we've got lots of clinicians. And so the interns get the opportunity to observe all of us in full flight. The key thing that I love that they learn from that is that there's no one way to skin a cat and that CBT is not God, okay? Just waiting for the lightning. Um, <laughs> because they get taught, we had, we had an interesting um, period of time 
with a cohort of students that were basically taught that if they didn't follow CBT by the book, they were being unethical. And when you're working in a perinatal population in particular, if you try and CBT them to death, all you're doing is telling a brand new mum who's really anxious that she's wrong, even in her own head, she's wrong. Not a, not a great, I mean, not what we do. We're compassionate, we're empathic, but when you're not looking at the psychodynamics of a diet, ah, oh, you know, that's another lecture. But um, they learn to see that we can all get to the same end by bringing in our own style and, and bringing in our own um, take on a set of symptoms, a history, uh, use of CBT, use of ACT, use of DBT, whatever it is that we bring to the table, we might all bring the same ingredients, but the recipe will taste slightly different. Okay. That takes a lot of anxiety away for students because they come to us feeling like they, they are meant to know it all. Okay. Um, we sometimes involve our students in triaging incoming referrals. So I've got a funded program, which I'll talk about in the next session about the rural practice, but I've got a funded program that means that we can offer um, a service in, to some of our uh, locations that is a no out-of-pocket cost, government funded, federally funded program. Because of that, we get more, it's a limited budget, so we get far more referrals than we can accommodate in that program. So sometimes we need to actually triage those referrals, identify who's most urgent, who's actually eligible for the program, are they actually better suited to another service and so on. So sometimes we'll involve the students in some of that work. Therapy extension is the key role. Once students have found their feet, that's the key role for them in our private practice setting. So when we think about clients being limited to 10 rebates a year, I don't limit them to 10 sessions. I remind them they can see us as much and as often as they need to, but there's 10 rebates. For those with a financial need or those with really frequent care needs, we can involve a student and then the, the primary clinician becomes like a consultant. So the student and the primary clinician will design the treatment program, the primary clinician might work on the guts of the treatment program, and then the student might do some skills development work on the side. So it might be some relaxation skills training or it might be some distress tolerance. So the student can expand what we're able to offer in a private practice setting at no additional cost to the client. So we're adding a little bit of a free service to the community. By the time they're at the end of their program with us, they might actually um, have a little caseload of their own. But we don't, we don't accept referrals directly to students. They've got to come via one of the key clinicians first. That's what happens when I'm not watching my kids too closely. They paint themselves with frozen blueberries. This is from <laughs> no, frozen blueberries. Uh, but you know, um, a couple of years ago, but yeah, I still get that face often when I'm not watching what goes on. The key concern that supervisors worry about in private practice is loss of revenue for time taken to supervise. So if a student needs an hour per day of placement and a provisional psych needs, what is it, two hours per 17, it was an hour per 17, 17 and a half um, hours of work, so basically two hours a week, that can be seen as a block of time that I can't see a client. Don't forget observation counts as supervision. So it's a whole bunch of supervision that is, in terms of their obligations, that is done through observation. And then you've got your coffee room chats as well in between, or that little 10 minutes in between where, what did you think about that session? What would you have done differently? What do you think I should do in the next session? What would you like to see me do with this client? How, what would you like me to talk about more? Let's catch up for a coffee after work if you want. We can actually talk about some of the directions we might take. So it doesn't have to be, in private practice, it doesn't have to be loss of income. And I think that's the number one fear. And that, that, those time obligations don't have to all be that set aside one-on-one -on -one time. You know, you do need to have a really good smattering of that to meet the obligations. But especially at the student end, they're, they're with you so much, they actually end up with, like I said before, far more hours in supervision than they actually require as a minimum. They well and truly, and certainly in my practice, they well and truly exceed their minimum supervision hours without it you know, sending us bankrupt in the meantime. So if you get creative around how you structure your supervision, you can actually make it work. Okay, that's not me. Um, the, the second most common fear 
that I hear from eligible supervisors is I don't feel that I'm ready to supervise. So it might be that um, you are just about to hit your clinical endorsement and you or you know, other area endorsement and you um, uh, that coincides with you actually being eligible to provide secondary supervision uh, and then the following year you'd be eligible to provide primary supervision assuming that you've gone straight through from from your masters um, so many clinicians at that point start walking backwards you know that 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 gif of, of Homer Simpson disappearing into the hedge, oh. that's what they do. Yeah, they, I'm not ready yet. And it's because they're feeling like, I've just got my clinical endorsement and I'm not ready, I don't know enough. And there's all these fears and imposter scenarios start playing out in their mind. And that's when I say to them, but APRA says you are ready. Whether you want to is another conversation, right? But let's talk about the fear compared with what APRA thinks. So APRA thinks you're eligible. So what's holding you back? And so in, in here, in the book, we do talk a little bit about, about some of those fears and sort of tackling those a little bit and overcoming some of those. Um, because a student isn't expecting you to have all the answers. They're expecting you to know where to find an answer. That's a shark's egg. I found that on the beach. I had no damn clue what it was. So uh, my kids were like, what is, what's, wow, 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 wow. And so I actually had to, uh, do the modern thing and uh, take a photo of it and post it on Facebook and say, anyone know what this is? And uh, a friend of mine said, yeah, it's a shark's egg. So, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we know how to find them out. And that's a really important lesson to teach our students. You don't have to know it all. And in fact, it's better to know that you don't know it all and to know when to ask a question. And I always come back to that with my students. You've got to know when to ask questions. Otherwise, that's when you start going off into cowboy territory and you know, scary things can start happening. So all of those fears around time, around competence, confidence, all that imposter stuff, it's all up here. And now we would have really good ideas on how we would manage that with a client, but we go all Homer Simpson <coughs> when it's us, uh, you know, being asked, are you ready to supervise yet? So I do talk a lot with my early career psychs that are at that stage around what's what's holding you back. What is it that you're, what, you, what are you scared of? And so in my practice, what we would do is we would actually buddy them. So we give them the opportunity to, to have a student shadow them. Something just happened. Uh, have a student shadow them for a while. And I talk to them about, this is kind of like supervision. It's kind of, you know, you're talking about clients, you're brainstorming together. There's not an awful lot that's different uh, apart from you having a signature on a piece of paper. And yes, of course, there's the whole clinical responsibility thing, but certainly in a group practice, that's much easier to share that, that, that load around because you might also have a secondary supervisor within the team as well. But you can do all this as a solo practitioner. That's how I started. So I was a solo practitioner for a long time. And um, you know, I had jobs in prisons and at university and community mental health and vocational rehab and all these other you know, exciting things that I did. And I kept a little private practice along the side. You know, I started off with one client a week. That's how my practice started. And eventually it was half a day a week. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in the big time now. I've got to read a room, it's all exciting. Until eventually I was ready to establish my own group practice. And I started by taking students in, and it was those students, you know, I was a bit spoiled. They were also research students of mine at the university, so I knew them, so it was a fairly safe arrangement from a relationship perspective. Um, but what I learned from that was how to be creative, how to make the time work, how to make those supervision obligations fit within what was possible within a private practice setting. And eventually those students stayed on, and those first students of mine were with me for like seven years, and they just stayed. And, um, and I think that the, that experience for me of being able to build a team based on starting at the student level and then building up. So now, you know, it's, it's like a no brainer. No brainer whatsoever. The trick is now when we get out of the student realm and everything's for free, what about people that I wanna pay? So that's where we're at now. So I mentioned before that there's a whole lot of change going on in my practice, a lot of people movement, and you know, when I look at them individually, the clinicians who are leading my team, they're ready. Like it's, it's the right time. We had a you know, bunch of factors 
come to, to come to the fore all at the same time. It's like this perfect storm scenario, which meant that we've got a lot of people moving at the same time, um, which sucks. Let's be honest. You know, emotionally, it's really bloody hard. <laughs> but um, I'm now at a point where I can really honestly say I can. I'm excited for where they're heading, and it's a, been a privilege to be. You know, a lot of them have been with me since I was students. They've stayed on. They're approaching that clinical endorsement stage, and of course, their heads pop up and they start looking around at what else is available to them. That's human nature. Just, you know, when it happens all at once, it's kind of a bit sucky, but you know, that's okay, get over it. So, what do we do to build a team and to make it a viable team? What I have worked on very, very hard over the last few years is increasing our revenue streams so that we're not 100% Medicare reliant. And I think that when private practices, so I've been in private practice since before Medicare, so I guess that kind of puts me in a, uh, an easier headspace to go down this road and looking at what revenue streams do we have that can incorporate therapists or provisional psychologists so that we're not reliant on only having people in our team who are Medicare eligible. So the funding program that I mentioned before, so that allows me to uh, employ provisional psychologists to be involved in that program. We've got some arrangements with uh, emergency services that allow us to incorporate supervised therapists, if they're appropriate to the referral, to, to incorporate them in the work that we do with those services. And we've got a number of other agencies where we're having conversations around that, about building up this profile of having therapists under supervision. And again, the more senior members of the team, myself included, then start acting a bit more like consultants. So we, we drive the therapy program and the therapist enacts the program. And the conversations that we've had with the agencies so far that we're talking to at the moment, I've named them, but it's not official yet, so I can't. Um, they're really happy with that idea because what they see, what they see is their need being met. They need this service provided to them at an affordable cost, knowing that it's going to be a good service. So we've got, you know, about 10 years as a group practice, 20 years for me as a, um, a, a psychologist. And so there's a track record there. And they've also, they also, there's the reputation that comes with having run, you know, another contracted service as well under funding. So when you start working on some of those additional revenue streams, and this is what I want you to think about now, is it, it starts to open the door. So there's an exercise in the book where I get you to brainstorm and do a journal, lots of journaling activities around thinking about, that's why I took the time, thinking about Think about all the services that don't have a Medicare rebate attached to them. The most obvious one is assessments. The second most obvious one is couples. Okay. There's no Medicare rebate for those services. Um, what other services are there that don't have a Medicare rebate but attached? I have feedback, is it? That's yeah. what I do it. No. <laughs> but yeah, look. I've often wondered what um, four plus two get paid for, and if you could tell me that. We don't do we don't do it in my practice, so I can't answer that specific question. But but yeah, yeah, there are things like that though that aren't eligible for Medicare rebates. So, for example, you know, parent sessions. If you're doing child therapy, if you have a session with a parent and the child's not in the room, there should not be a Medicare rebate process for that session. Yeah, there's lots when you start scratching at the surface. There are actually lots of things that psychologists do that don't have a Medicare rebate attached. But in private practice, we get stuck. And so there'll be services that we're not offering because there's no Medicare rebate attached. But when you start digging around, you say, well, what are the, what are the counsellors doing? And what are, the, what are the social workers doing? And what, are the, what about the couples therapists and the sex therapists and all these others? And they might be psychologists, but they've niched themselves in an area that doesn't necessarily attract a Medicare rebate. And when you start playing around with some of those ideas, very quickly you generate a list. And before you know it, you've managed to create a caseload for a provisional psychologist. So we've got in my Launceston team at the moment, we've got a counsellor who is partway through an honours in psychology. She's got 25, I think, years experience as a couples and relationships therapist. And she's an active paramedic. So trauma is her thing. Uh, and, and we have no trouble marketing her skills. 
because the work that she does with couples and uh, emergency responders and you know uh, employment related trauma isn't necessarily covered by Medicare some of what she does and she's had a successful business in the past interstate running a counselling service focusing on her areas of interest so she's now working in our team under my supervision and the supervision of my principal psych and um, she can't attract the Medicare rebate so it's no different for the provisionals so thinking creatively about if we're only thinking about Medicare then we cut ourselves off at the knees okay so it is doable but you have to get creative. You have to start thinking outside of the square, outside of the Medi Medicare shaped square. Good question. So, so, so she sees clients for counselling, couples yeah. counselling. Yeah. But she still charges, and presumably you get a proportion of that. For the provisional site, though, would you still charge? Absolutely, because I'm paying them. Proportion of that. Yeah. 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 So the provisionals. Uh, no. So the uh, provisionals are on salary. From the university. No interns, student interns. No, we don't. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, um, so with a student, um, so typically with a provisional, we're looking at someone who's either nearing the end of their master's program and they're just, you know, they're just tying up loose ends or they might be just finishing off their thesis um, or they're a five plus one. So they're coming to us with that full suite of training. <coughs> they're coming to us with, you know, a little bit of experience. Some of them have actually got a lot of experience. We've got a provisional with us in Launceston who's employed full time. And she has um, you know, quite a bit of experience before going back and doing her five plus one. So there are, she, I think she started the four plus two and then decided to go back and do a five plus one. So we, we don't necessarily have to assume that provisional psychs are experienceless when they come to us. You know, so it make, that again makes it easier to market their skills. <coughs> of course, once they finish their masters, they're registered. Yeah, if it's an M psych program, if it's the MPP, no. Oh, okay. And the tough part for them, for the MPPs, is the university doesn't arrange their plus one year. Okay. That's up to them because then the university university's done with them once they've finished their their one year of training. So it's you know it's often described as a fast track, but it's actually a bit harder, mm -hmm. I think, than doing an M psych because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they squash all their coursework into a single year, and then they've got to find their own <coughs> plus one year. Uh, with mixed success depending on where they are and how flexible they are. So we have, in light of uh, all of the changes going on in our staffing at the moment, it's had me really thinking a lot about the comings and goings of, of team members in private practice. and and this fairly predictable pattern uh, of team members coming in and when they've reached a certain qualification level, whether it's full registration or endorsement, typically then they start looking around at what other opportunities they've got, natural thing to do. Um, and so we've now started, and I've only just announced this this week, um, we've now decided, I've now decided, to formalise a graduate program in private practice. So this is, and coincidentally, there's a couple of other practice owners around Australia that we've had the same idea at the same time. And I think this is all part of, you know, the shortage of psychologists there. And it's really hard to recruit, which is, thank you, Jeff. Was that five? I can't say five minutes. Thank you. So this is why I talk so much about incorporating students in your team to help you build. It's a long game. You're pay, playing a long game by incorporating students in your team because they will help with your caseload. Even if they're students, they will help with your caseload. But you're hoping that you're going to, over time, build them into your team as stayers. And so we're now formalising that. So what we're doing now is we're, we're um, establishing a graduate program where we will have a one-year graduate program for five plus ones and a two-year graduate program for registrars. And at the end of each of those programs, there's no assumption that they're going to stay. They'll actually have to apply to stay as an ongoing member of the team. So it names it right at the beginning, that we understand that you might want to move on at the end of that program. We understand that you might have gotten out of it what you want out of it, and we've gotten something out of it while you've been with us as well. And let's have a really open and adult conversation about what your goals are going to be. So at around the sort of three months before the end of that program stage, you can start having conversations. Now that you've had this amount of experience in a private practice setting, How's that fitting with your longer term goals? Because when they come straight out of uni, they don't know what their longer term goals are. They don't know what area they want to specialise in. 
they all they know is they want to get out there, get working, and and confront that imposter fear as well that they typically have. So there's sort of three months before the end mark, you can start having that conversation openly with them. What do you see yourself doing and what can I do to help you get there, even if it means you leaving me? How can I facilitate a successful transition to your next stage? And then they leave, if they do leave, with a really positive experience in your team and a really positive experience of what it's like to leave a job with you know, their dignity intact and yours, hopefully, <coughs> hopefully as well. So that's pretty much it. Um, you don't have to worry about buying the book because I've got it here for you guys. So anyone who hasn't got their copy of the book, I will give that to you today. Um, but any questions? The last five, few minutes, any, any other questions? It seems, it seems wise to sort of stagger. I just started it. Yeah. Since I practiced cybernetically in the last six months, a lot of this is very Congratulations. <laughs> seems unwise to stagger the hiring on you so that you don't get a bit of, I'm assuming, perfect storm and they all leave yes. at once and they're all finished at yes. once, so that's what I've been wondering. Yes. Is that what you... Yeah, exactly right. Because we, we two years ago, we took on a lot of staff to attract uh, to for this new contract that we got that was new two years ago, new two and a half years ago. And so what we're seeing now yeah. is the outflow of all of those clinicians. Two to three years is pretty average. So we took on a lot at one time, so we're losing a lot at one time. But yeah, that's... And is this program that you put together, is that something that other folks, other supervisors might be interested in? Because I'm certainly wondering what I'm going to be teaching, how I'm going to structure my supervision. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much competencies, but... Yep. Um, so I run mentoring. Now there's a free group. Oh, it won't be. There's a page. My page is Finding Proof page. But when you, if you search me and look for the meeting room under groups on Facebook, that's a free Facebook group that you can join. And it's for, for mental health professionals. And uh, a lot of them are supervisors. So I also have a free group called Psychology Supervisors Australia. Um, but I opened up the meeting room because I realised that there weren't just psychologists that were interested in having these conversations. Um, and so I often provide content to support mental health professionals, particularly those in supervisory roles and leadership roles. Um, and now I have mentoring programs as well, but I'm not here to sell <laughs> that to you. <laughs> yeah. Can I just start, so you say this was, which site is this going to be on, the, your presentation? The rural stuff, sorry? No, no, this presentation. Yes, yeah, so this will be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this now, bye. But this will be on Facebook.